if we'd set out to destroy adult learning opportunities in Britain in a conscious way, we couldn't have done it as well as we've done it by accident over the last 15 years. How would you describe the current state of adult learning in England? So if you look at formal provision of being able to join join courses that are funded, then we've lost two million adults from further education funded activity and we've seen a drop of more than 50% of adults in higher education in the last five years, so um, 15 years, five years. There's been an expansion of self-organised University of Third Age, for example, or, or you know, reading groups, um, book groups and so on. But, but those are usually taken by relatively educationally confident and privileged people. What we've seen disappear is the rich range of opportunities to put your toe in the water. And how does that compare with other countries? There's a huge amount of adult education in East Asia, but that's mostly focused on economic um, um, productivity. But it's usually got a rather broader view of what will help contribute to vocational development. So it will include some kind of cultural creativity issues. And that is changing internationally because of concerns about what the implications of artificial intelligence and robotics are for a world in which people need to be flexible and creative and not merely to be able to be trained for the job that they do. Scandinavia, the Nordic countries, have been way out for 150 years as, as a kind of study circle democracies where people choose to meet, find a leader, the state pays whatever it is that you want to learn and most people, eight, eight in ten, will engage in some kind of learning uh, over a two, three year period. Much higher levels of participation, but good levels in Switzerland and Austria. Now we used to be, uh, after them, the highest um, participating country for a long while and we've just seen that er 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 eroded. Uh, and. I mean, if I could just make the general point that education systems are always a tension between education for work, if you like, and education for fulfilment, and that we've flipped over the edge in Britain in the last 15 years. So playfulness, the learning for curiosity, the things that adults and, and early years kind of characteristically have in common, has been squeezed more and more to the margins, not only by funding, but also by the kind of control of the system that, that regulation and, and um, standards and, and um, inspection and so on. So I was going to ask about the kind of continuities and, and commonalities between adult learning and kind of earlier education. You mentioned the word playfulness, which is an interesting term. Oh, yes. How does that kind of fit in? Uh, Augusta Boal's Theatre of the Oppressed, which is all about playfulness and um, great inspiration to have. Uh, you, you get people uh, confronting a shared problem through a series of physical exercises, creating tableaus about what the problem is and then tableaus about what the answer to it would be. And then anyone in the group can say, right, how do you get from here to there? I'm going to move everybody around and we'll say we'll do this and that. And as soon as somebody else in the audience doesn't agree with um, what they're proposing, they take over being what's called the joker. And by the end of a couple of hours, you've had the most sophisticated form of political education happening. And it's people roaring with laughter. And well, you know, for a period I was president of the Preschool Learning Alliance. I was so struck by the similarity between the earliest years where um, learning is the curiosity of choosing for yourself a range, or within a structure, a range of opportunities for your own development. And when I began in adult education, people used to talk about the negotiated curriculum in which students, you know, choose to propose things and students would change it together quite dramatically and lurking in the background kind of her 
Herbert Cole's um, uh, argument uh, that um, if walking and talking were taught in schools, we'd have a lot of mute non-walkers, that the reason, the reason people learn to walk and talk is because they do it in different rhythms and different ways. Anyone who's had children knows mm. they don't stand up and walk at the same time. And a bit like driving, once they can do it, you forget whether they did it at six months or two years. And in a way, adult learning's like that, mm. that, that if you can draw on people's experience and, and give them a chance to explore and, and, and change what they're doing, then you, it's almost like a drain, like heroin. You kind of, it's extremely difficult to get people to stop after. And I think that's quite in common between the less structured bits of the system and that it used to be primarily secondary education that was very yeah. tightly bounded, aimed at the labour market. But slowly that's, with you know, this spread of neoliberal thinking, it's kind of spread in both directions to affect all kinds of adult activity and, and to structure more and more what happens to young, youngest children. And if we think of um, what maybe earlier education can learn from adult learning, what are the kind of, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about the, the negative aspects, yeah. what are the strengths uh, these days still of, of adult learning in England? Well, I, I thought something that at its best it did well was, um, and you see it in the work of the Workers' Education Association, it, um, or of a number of the cooperative kind of initiatives in education, is co-production of, of valuing professionalism and voluntary activity. And I mean, with, with the growth of professional staff in early years activity, and with the growth of sort of teaching assistants into schools, you've got the opportunity for a kind of uh, voluntary passion and structured professionalism to meld. But the key is to value the experience of the, of the passion as well as the discipline. And I, th I think that's something adult learning had a, a lot more of when I, when I was earlier, when I was a principal in London, we used to have the dilemma of the silversmiths. <laughs> that is, people wanted to keep old crafts yeah. in the curriculum. But frankly, the, all the people who were willing to teach silversmithing couldn't be doing with our elaborate training programmes. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I thought, well, we've just got a team to each. You've got to have them doing the silversmithing and someone in, at least early on in a group, enabling the process work to happen so that learners all genuinely got a voice, but there's always a tension. In the same way, in, in early, early years activity, I think the, the visiting speaker, the uh, external person who comes in and tells yeah. jokes and stories, they have a vivid and important role to play. And then what about the kind of, what would you say the barriers and the challenges that adult learning faces, well, particularly? Again, thinking back to the links yes. to earlier education. Well, I mean, both suffer in the same way. I mean, you, uh, you know, uh, Shel Rubinson, who's a, a Canadian scholar, um, a Swedish Canadian scholar, says you have to look at l the long arm of the family and the long arm of the school as shaping the experience of learners. And if that's true of adults, yeah. adults are the parents of children, so that in a way, you know, people spend no more than 15% of their childhood in schools. It's fundamentally the same issue about how do you give adults the confidence to spill over to their children. The Indian proverb, uh, African proverb, sorry, uh, that if you teach a woman to read and write, you've taught the village. Always worried about what happens if you teach a bloke. <laughs> Perhaps nothing very much. But that, that idea of spillover, you can see there's really strong research evidence from the literacy activity that when you did family literacy, adults and young people together, the interplay and enthusiasm of what mum's doing or dad's doing and what I'm doing work brilliantly for the children, 92% improvement and so on. Yeah. And then almost exactly the same um, results for adults as well of, of being fired by wanting to, you know, help create the climate for your child that I better go and 
uh, sort something out in the area. And we had family workshops grow in the in the years of richness of adult education, which were extraordinary uh, growing events in which new curricula, new forms of activity emerged. And I think often we, we learn as a society by inventing a new way of doing something and, and, then, and then drawing its lessons and generalising them. So in Australia currently, um, what do you do about old blokes who retire from Fordist kind of production of one sort or another. They have men's sheds where people coalesce together, meet and talk. With. They're very different than women's neighbourhood centres. Mm. Um, they often involve blokes not saying very much, but doing quite a lot with wood. In the seminar, there's kind of three themes yeah. we're going to pick up, um, hopefully. Yeah. Um, one, one's about participatory practice, which you've already talked about. Yeah, I mean, it, it's if you didn't like school, it, you've got to work really hard to make it possible for people. I think that's exactly parallel to what you do. My daughter's a primary school teacher. Uh, what do you do about national standards over here? And a child of drug addicted parents who comes in who's not continent, who, who hasn't really got an emotional language for communication. I mean, what you do is make them safe before they can do any of the other things. and. And frankly, a lot of adults, when they arrive, arrive having to unlearn their prior experiences of education, if they're willing to come at all. Mm -hmm. And then presumably, that kind of follows that, if we're thinking about um, building competence and, and learner voice, that kind of thing, yeah. in both early and compulsory education and adult learning, the kind of reluctant learners, or the learners who had, had unsatisfactory experiences, Getting, their, getting to their voice is not yeah. straightforward. Well, it isn't straightforward, but actually if you put effort into providing spaces and value and listen to what learners say, and you give them um, opportunities to act at all kinds of levels, sort of going off and telling Parliament what they think on the one hand, but also um, what, <laughs> what do you do when you turn up and the lecturer has just left a, a note on the wall if you're a university student? student that's not good enough really or if you're a small child how how do we like to do this what do we think the best way is i think um learner voices are uh, a reminder that it's not for the system it's for the people really yeah. the third theme is around agency and autonomy kind of yeah. decision making that kind of thing where do you see kind of parallels or, or lack of parallels there well i don't know and one of the things uh, sorry I won't be at the seminar to discuss is what the parallel there is for adults. Uh, Raymond Williams had this wonderful typology of why do adults turn to learning in times of change? He says to understand what's going on, to adjust to it, or make adjustments, and to shape it. And I suppose I think, you know, with Piaget and all that, the, the aim is to help people go through that process to end up with the agency to do something about it. And what I think both ends of the education system have to teach the box, the school, is that you've got to have the freedom for those things to happen, the freedom to play, to fail, as well as to systematically acquire skills and knowledge. It's the, it's the UNESCO issue of, right? yes, you've got to learn to know and, and to do things, but learning to live together and learning to become yourself, the, those things need unstructured, playful time, and we should be celebrating what we know about it.